I'm the VP of Business Development at Flexion Therapeutics, which is a 300-person biopharmaceutical company located just outside of Boston. Uh, and thank you all for staying in the session, especially considering happy hour is about 30 minutes from now. We are a public tr publicly traded company listed on the NASDAQ. This is our safe harbor statement. So who is Flexion Therapeutics? So we're a bit of a different animal compared to a lot of the companies presenting here this week. We uh, have focused on developing and commercializing novel local therapies for musculoskeletal disorders. So musculoskeletal, very large patient populations, significant unmet medical need, and very little innovation over the past 20 years. So that's one differentiator. Another differentiator is that we have developed and are now commercializing in the US our first approved product known as Zilretta, which is an intraarticular or into the joint extended release corticosteroid that employs a proprietary microsphere technology for treating osteoarthritis knee pain. So after injection into the joint, Zilretta slowly releases active drug over the course of at least 12 weeks. What I'm going to spend most of my time on today is FX201, which is our preclinical stage gene therapy that's also injected into the knee that causes the joint cells to produce an anti-inflammatory drug called interleukin-1 receptor antagonist whenever inflammation is present within the joint. And it does so via the inclusion of an inflammation-sensitive promoter con con contained in the vector construct. We acquired FX201 from a German biotech company called GeneQuine Biotherapeutics at the end of last year. We have a strong commercial team, a very seasoned drug development team, and are fully executing on our plans. Regarding 201, we did have a pre-IND meeting with the FDA earlier this year and are anticipating filing an IND and starting first in human clinical trials next year. Also importantly, we have a strong balance sheet and reported $340 million in cash at the uh, end of June. Quick snapshot of our leadership team. Flexion was, was co-founded about 11 years ago by Mike Clayman and Neil Bodick, who worked together for a long time at Lilly and developed the chorus model there of fast and efficient clinical proof of concept development. We also have people on the team who have deep biologics experience, including Carrie Wentworth, our head of regulatory, and Dan LeBlanc, our head of manufacturing. Carrie, Dan, and Neil are here this week, so it would be great to connect with them. Quick snapshot of our pipeline of publicly disclosed programs. You see Zilretta at the top, which is approved for osteoarthritis knee pain. We're working on expanding Zilretta to possible additional indications in musculoskeletal. And at the bottom, you can see highlighted as FX201, our intraarticular gene therapy, which we're developing for osteoarthritis knee pain, as well as potentially disease modification which in osteoarthritis is really the holy grail. So you may be wondering why musculoskeletal as an area of focus. So for a number of reasons. The patient population is enormous. I'm sure everybody in this room has a friend, a relative, a colleague who suffers from some form of musculoskeletal condition, low back pain, neck pain, arthritis. And over half of the US adults are affected with some sort of musculoskeletal condition. Then you can consider the costs associated with treating these disorders, almost a trillion dollars in costs for treatment and lost wages. This is a huge opportunity with very little innovation. If we look at knee OA specifically, which is by far the largest degenerative joint condition, 20 million Americans have knee osteoarthritis, and this can significantly impact their quality of life. 25% have daily pain while walking, or have difficulty climbing stairs, kneeling, or stooping, significantly impacting their daily life. Unfortunately, since the 90s, the average age of being di diagnosed with NEOA has fallen by nearly 20 years, from 72 to the mid-50s. And this tr has transitioned, translated into a very long treatment period of non-surgical treatments, almost 20 years, that these patients uh, have to deal with this. Beyond the symptomatic relief from currently used therapies, which provide, can provide neither the magnitude or the duration of pain relief, there are no approved disease-modifying osteoarthritis drugs, or D-modes as they're called, available. And no drug has been shown to prevent, slow, or stop the structural progression of the joint degradation in a way. This has led to patients progressing on the disease to the point where no current therapies are working, and they elect to have a total knee replacement where the damaged cartilage and bone is taken out, metal inserts are put in to resurface the joint. 
These are happening at a rate of more than a million procedures in the U.S. a year at a cost of tens of thousands of dollars per procedure. So why has it been so difficult to develop uh, drugs for osteoarthritis, both pain and disease modification? Well, partly it's because it's hard to deliver drugs into the joint space to the relevant tissues for a couple of reasons. One, drugs that are given systemically do not efficiently reach the joint space. Neither small molecules or large molecules can get across the extracellular matrix or the capillary endothelium to make it into the synovial fluid. On the other hand, you can take a drug and inject it into the joint space intraarticularly, but both small molecules and large molecules are cleared rapidly from the space via the lymphatics and small blood vessels. So our hypothesis is that we could use a local gene therapy approach that would lead to a sustained production of an intraarticular protein to overcome these intraarticular bioavailability issues. So if that's the case, what's the right target for the gene therapy vector. So for a long time, it was thought that osteoarthritis was just a wear and tear disorder, a mechanical dysfunction. But the reality is inflammation, we believe, plays a critical role in the pathogenesis and, and pain associated with the disease. So the synovium or lining in the joint is infiltrated with inflammatory cells. These become activated and they release pro-inflammatory cytokines like IL-1, IL-6 that lead to pain. And along with that, the inflammation can accelerate the degradation of the joint tissues. The increase of the pro-inflammatory cytokines causes an increase in matrix metalloproteinases, which start to break down the extracellular matrix. They also break down the cartilage. Bony outgrowths develop called osteophytes. The subchondral bone thickens, and synovial inflammation is amplified. We believe that IL-1 is the key orchestrator in this process, both to increase pain and potentially structural progression, and it's known that IL-1 levels are increased inside the osteoarthritic joint. So what's the solution? FX201 is a helper-dependent adenovirus vector, or HDAD, that expresses an anti-inflammatory protein that targets the IL-1 receptor, called IL-1RA. We believe FX201 has the potential to provide durable symptomatic relief and be disease-modifying. What you see here is a schematic of how FX201 acts when injected into the joint. The vector is taken up by uh, synovi synoviocytes, uh, ligament tissues, synovial fibroblasts, and fat pad, and in the setting of inflammation, because of this inflammation-inducible promoter, turns on the expression of interleukin-1 receptor antagonist, which can then flow into the joint, block the effects of IL-1 against the IL-1 receptor, and alleviate pain and possibly arrest disease progression. I should mention that a helper-dependent adenovirus is an adenovirus that is fully gutted of all viral genes with only the DNA included to express IL-1-RA. So why IL-1-RA is a therapeutic for osteoarthritis? Well, it turns out IL-1-RA is a validated anti-inflammatory protein drug. There's a product on the market called Anakinra or Kinneret that's been FDA approved since 2001 that's a human recombinant form of IL-1-RA administered by daily subcutaneous injections. It's had an excellent safety profile uh, since its time in the, in the market and has been on the market for, as I said, since 2001. And here's where the story gets really interesting. So IL-1-RA has been shown to provide symptomatic relief and a reduction in disease progression in a variety of models, preclinical models of osteoarthritis in more than 10 published studies. And this efficacy has been consistently observed across species mouse, rat, rabbit, dog, and horse, whether IL-1-RA is delivered as the recombinant protein or by a gene therapy using different viral vectors. And I'll show you some data from a horse model supporting this effect to both reduce disease progression and reduce pain and function with the horse equivalent of FX201. Just as important, IL-1-RA is clinically validated in osteoarthritis symptom relief. There's a handful of published studies that show when IL-1-RA is injected into the joint locally that it provides benefits on pain and function, but these benefits don't persist. This is because we think the rapid clearance and short half-life of IL-1-RA in the joint prevents it from uh, uh, maintaining a durable effect. So let's take a look at some of the helper-dependent antivirus data supporting why we think it's a good vector to deliver IL-1-RA to the joint. On the top, you can see some bioluminescence data from both the helper-dependent adenovirus and the first-generation adenovirus in mice, 
where the viruses are expressing luciferase as a, as a signal, and clearly the virus is not distributing outside of the joint, which we believe will reduce the risk of systemic toxicity after injection into the joint. On the bottom, you can see that the helper-dependent adenovirus in blue shows expression of the gene that persists for out to over a year versus that produced from the first generation adenovirus, which degrades rapidly and only lasts for a few weeks. What you see here is an example of the inflammation sensitive promoter included in the FX201 vector. This is data from a normal horse, uh, which was injected with four different doses of the FX201 horse equivalent. And what you can see is that on day one, uh, the acute inflammatory response due to the capsid injection causes a rapid rise in interleukin-1 receptor antagonist in the joint. On days two to five, the horse was injected with, with was given NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which knocked down inflammation and thus reducing the levels of IL-1RA that were produced by the vector. These levels of IL-1RA continued to go down until 92 days into the study, when the animal was injected with LPS into the joint, stimulating inflammation, IL-1RA was then produced by the vector, demonstrating this inflammation-sensitive property. This data shows uh, results from the horse osteoarthritis model, which we believe mimics the human osteoarthritis condition most closely. What you see here is that with two different doses of FX201, the equine equivalent, the levels of IL-1RA that were produced over the course of the 72-day study were similar to those that had been shown effective with other preclinical models of osteoarthritis. So this gave us some confidence that the virus was doing what it was intended to do and producing therapeutic levels of IL-1RA over the course of the period at both low and high doses, which were around 10 to the 11 and 10 to the 12 viral particles. This is the data set that really got us excited about this program. On the left, you can see the pain and function improvements for the two different doses of FX201 in the horse. And on the right, you can see the structural improvements, both from a macroscopic perspective, the total fibrillation score, as well as a microscopic perspective, the total histology score. And in both cases of low and high doses, we saw a dramatic effect on lameness improvements, range of motion in the horse, flexion and effusion, as well as on improvements in joint structure both macroscopically and histologically. So this gave us some confidence that we'll see a symptomatic effect moving this forward as well as possible disease progression effects. Just as important as understanding the efficacy profile in the animals, we wanted to take a look at the safety and tolerability profile. So we assessed a variety of parameters, no acute toxicity seen after the FX201 horse equivalent was injected in the horse OA model, no chronic toxicities, no vector distribution was seen outside the joint, and no vector shedding was observed. Given that flexion is a new entrant in the gene therapy world, since we acquired the 201 program at the end of last year, we've been building a network of collaborators to help us move this program forward into the clinic. We work with uh, a couple of companies within the Millipore Sigma family on the manufacturing and testing side. We're working with uh, Baylor College of Medicine and Philip Ng's lab, who's the helper-dependent adenovirus guru. We're working with Charles River on the toxicology program, and we've maintained a relationship with the principals at GeneQuine to help us move this program aggressively into the clinic. And finally, in closing, just where we are with the program, we had a pre-IND meeting, as I mentioned earlier this year, and pending successful completion of GLP talks, we anticipate filing our IND and initiating first in human clinical studies in OA in 2019. So just to summarize, we believe FX201 is a really interesting asset that we think may have both symptomatic relief, durable symptomatic relief, and possibly slow disease progression in the osteoarthritis patients. So thanks for your time. Thank you.